We're back with you on this Sunday. Good morning, everyone. It is time for your favorite news analysis program, Media Monitor. And we're coming to you live here on the SABC News Channel. I am Alicia Ntlantlajali, and I've got a whole hour to unpack some of the top select news makers of this week. Coming up on our discussions, we start by reviewing the alleged sexual assault of 87 pupils at an Orlando primary school. We cannot forget to deliberate on the spy tapes appeal court ruling that of course invalidated the decision to drop the charges against President Jacob Zuma. We also look at continental developments mainly in Kenya, Zimbabwe as well as Liberia. That's all coming up soon but first I have the leading stories of this hour. Risks to the global economy are compounding concerns around South Africa's economic prospects in the short term. And that's the view of Finance Minister Malu Sikigaba, who was speaking at the conclusion of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank biannual meetings out in Washington this week. They gather twice a year to discuss best practices in global monetary and financial policy. Sun is out in terms of economic growth globally. Countries urged to err on the side of caution. Also, that the risks remained. They may be balanced, but they remain skewed to the downside. If you consider the geopolitical and uh, economic uncertainties, met with all three ratings agencies ahead of his medium-term budget speech later this month, and seemed less certain about staving off possible future downgrades improving immediately in the in the short term but in the medium term i see us getting out of the current investment grade he affirmed treasury's position that a nuclear build program as part of the energy mix would have to be shelved for now the south african economy at the present moment is not in a position where it can be able to 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 carry the burden of nuclear technology with sub-Saharan growth at a tepid 2.4%, calls for a renewed push in skills development and better education outcomes in Africa. Revolution, a revolution which is a revolution of mind, a revolution which allows to build a new social contract in terms of knowledge sharing of education and empowering people to transform our economies. Countries urge to build greater resilience, while African economies must diversify faster to remain competitive. Sherman Bryce Pease, SABC News, Washington. Back home, former Finance Minister Pravin Gordon says South Africans must reclaim the state the same way they fought against apartheid. Gordon was speaking at the annual Ahmed Katrada lecture here in Johannesburg. The lecture focused on state capture and on how the people can recapture the state from what Gordon calls looters. It was a gathering that brought together young and old, listening attentively to Pravin Godan's proclamation on the decay of the state. The lecture was met with emotional responses. We need some of you to step up to the plate and if not apologize for actually being tacitly com complicit in that state capture project, at least tell us why you remained there and remained silent for so long. It was evident in Godan's rebuttal that this sentiment struck a nerve. The, the question is, did, did we really remain silent inside? Read the budget speeches that we made. Read the public statements that we made. Godan says it's time South Africans reclaim the state or recapture it from the so-called looters. He says the ANC's December elective conference will also be critical for the purpose of undoing project state capture. The former finance minister, who has publicly endorsed presidential candidate Cyril Ramaphosa's campaign, says the ANC branches must ask themselves who will serve that purpose the best. All the polls are already indicating that he is the most favoured choice, more generally, both in the, amongst the public uh, and amongst uh, ANC members at the moment. One of those opinion polls is Kentner TNS which places Ramaphosa as the front-runner. But it's the ANC's 5,000 delegates to the elective conference who will have the final say. Aldrin Simpia, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, police in Pumalanga are searching for four gunmen connected to the killing of six people at an informal settlement in Urkhiz. Four of the victims died at the scene, while two others succumbed to their injuries later on in hospital. 
One of the victims was shot seven times at close range. A suspected case of revenge killings as four armed men entered this informal settlement on Thursday, the main aim to kill a man they sought. When they couldn't find him, they shot his mother seven times. They then went on to shoot five others known to be associated with the men they were seeking. We're therefore looking for these people because we cannot allow a situation where, you know, some will go on rampage, killing people as if nothing happened. So let us, you know, together ourselves as the police and the community, you know, work together so that we can put the acts of these people into an abrupt end. The community has been shaken by the killings, while the families of the victims have fled the area. We are here to work at the mines, but now we are not safe. We are fearing for our lives. If we had guns, we would have protected ourselves and shoot them back. Five of the deceased are Lesotho nationals, while one is South African. Sipo Stirman, Ochis in Pumalang. All right, and those were your top and leading news this hour. After the break, we take a look at stories that are trending on social media this past week. Don't go away. Hello and a warm welcome to PM News and we're broadcasting live from Johannesburg. Four decades later, the family is still seeking closure. We need the truth and the truth must be told. Children often go undiagnosed because they are hidden away. About one million people in South Africa live with autism. Creative recycling at play. The mosaic has been around forever. Uh, I just had to find a new fresh way to put and a new spin to put on it. So I just wonder I decided why not recycled cans. Stay tuned to PM News for all your news updates every Saturday and Sunday from 1500 hours. Welcome back. Well, on the show this morning, we're very pleased to welcome SABC Digital News producer, Miss Babalule Parker. Good morning. You look so cute. Thank you, Alicia. How I'll are you? I'll die for that hairstyle. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. And of course, on the main set, we do have political analyst, Professor Sipo Siepe, and media analyst, Mr. Melo Machulejo. Gentlemen, you've been dressed the same. What's the theme today? Good morning. Good morning. It's breast cancer month. I see. You see, Melo is always doing it for a great cause. Babalo, what were the trending stories at? this week i can tell you the number one pick i mean devastating storms in durban and of course here in Gauteng, i think people forgot that it was actually johannesburg it started before yes, it, it, it was, durban. It was yeah. durban so what have you got for us on on on, on the digital front so like you said obviously the first major trending topic for this week was the storms which mm -hmm. dominated headlines and we just have a few pictures of users on social media um at province saying We'll just have to sit this hailstorm out. Be careful out there. Mm. This is the hailstorm. In the, he was in Santon at the time when it happened. My and goodness. then we also have a few other tweets coming through from other users. There was a big hailstorm in Rudaport and My other parts goodness. of the West Rand. I miss so that. So you can see all the... Well, there's not really any damage here, but yeah. you can see the intensity of the hail, yeah. of the yeah. hailstorm. Yeah. And, and then we also geez. have... A, a, yeah, like those are gigantic. Yeah, Houting no, weather saying huge. some huge... Some huge pellets after a hailstorm in Krugerstorp and in the Baylor Felt. Mm, it's very so, yeah. blurry. I can see that. We can't see that properly, Baba. Let's, uh, do you have any more tweets? And then on we the have story? tweets from the Durban Storm. Mm, again. Let's have a look at the tweets from the Durban Storm. My goodness. I These mean, are just a few pictures. I was so yeah. shocked. You know, I normally mm. drive by the old airport when I go home. It's literally 11 kilometers from home. Mm. And then I saw a sea of water where it's usually just a stream of cars. It was the most concerning thing ever. I literally had to call home. A lot of every people were stuck minutes. in traffic for over five hours just in an attempt to get home and then we obviously have a few tweets coming through from people yeah, that's, that's yeah there's another picture there of people goodness. stuck in the traffic mm. you can imagine all the insurance claims <laughs> 
that had to be processed. Well, that's during hoping the course of that the week. people actually do yes. have uh, the insurance. There. Do we have any more tweets on do this have one? Tweets? Let's read. They're all lives uh, matter. Says uh, hashtag Durban Storm. Hashtag Holiday Nightmare. Never experienced something like this. Why isn't our drainage systems maintained? Mm. Begs back to the question of how do we maintain our yes. infrastructure as well. Mm. And what is Michelle we have Langa another there? tweet from Michelle Langa saying, Dear, please keep people safe and please, I hope there are no lives lost. Mm. Please keep everyone safe. Everyone but safe. unfortunately, there 14 were some, people... Absolutely. Yeah, and some I mean, there are some people that are still missing as well. For. And it started at yes. two. I mean, that number is just slowly increasing. Mm. Zandi, this is, uh, please pray for us, guys. Hashtag Durban Storm. Hashtag Durban Rains. When they so... Uh, what is that? What, when they so mnala uh, we when him. we need it. Basically, we need mm. God during these mm. times, mm. during the storms. Sure, man. It was uh, absolutely devastating. Stating there. Mm. Gentlemen, let's talk to you. Professor Sieb, did you, were you missed by the storms? Were you caught in any torrent waters? No, I was not, but uh, I did get an SMS from the insurance company, mm. which is uh, really a first uh, for them to step up to mm -hmm. say, for those of you who may have been affected, please, please uh, let contact us. Know. us yes. Normally, uh, in the past, they've always said they don't cover what they call acts of God, yeah. but they, at least uh, it's uh, encouraging that uh, quite a number of them said uh, to their people who subscribe to them that please say uh, check we might be able to help mm, that's before the co-payments that we've <laughs> seen there professor don't be too happy just yet Mello, what did you think about the storms yeah. do we have enough infrastructure to react to such uh, uh, natural disasters i mean obviously i mean our fiscus is really constrained and restricted to be able to deal with issues i mean we're trying to deal with apartheid backlogs as it yeah. were i think for me one thing that's interesting in terms of these disasters is the differentiated response which reflects our sort of inequality in society, right? Because I was speaking to somebody saying that people's cars, I mean, like getting uh, drowned in water and so on. And this person says, yeah, I can hear the car issue, yeah. but for me, my shack is leaking. Mm. Yeah. That for me is the concern, mm -hmm. right? Because you're having all these hailstorms and they're breaking uh, people's shacks and houses and so on. So, I mean, even in some of these things, sure. we cannot really escape our inequality mm. in society. Mm. 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 Very interesting indeed that it takes natural disasters to see. Sense just, of uh, you know, mm. yeah, we see the inequality mm. line is also very rampant there. Let's look at the next big hashtag, of course. What was the next big hashtag, Baban? So, there's a mother in the Eastern Cape who's been dubbed the Lion Hammer. I was here a few weeks ago, actually, Alicia, uh, spoke speaking about to you it, about yeah. it. So she was basically helping her daughter, who was being raped at the time, and then she stabbed one of, uh, two of the guys, and then the other one died, unfortunately. Mm. And then it was a court case. Now the NPA handed down judgment, and they decided not to prosecute her because they were arguing that her actions were meant at the time to defend um, her defenseless daughter. Mm. So we have a few comments coming through from people on social media, just basically saying that they are in support of her bravery and they're mm. in awe of her actions. That's Mark Pilo. They're saying this judgment this year is off the South African hashtag line mama who was acquitted of murder charge after killing one of her daughter's rapists. Mm. Sense of justice all around. What is Miss Gupta saying there? Uh, Miss Gupta says, <laughs> this always brings tears to my eyes. Now it's tears of joy. I'm so happy she's no longer facing charges. Mm. Hashtag country duty. Hashtag lion mama. Mm, must have been a trending topic. Andy says, now she can go home and be with her family, work on her healing from this trauma. Mm. I believe she will continue to get support. What a brave woman. Hashtag lion mama. Gentlemen, let's start with you, Melo. What did you make of these developments? I mean, I found this uh, very scenario very much uh, interesting and tragic at the same time because it speaks to sort of like the condition of our country where women, I think, really do not feel protected in society and people do not feel safe to walk around because there's men, uh, predatory men waiting, lurking to rape mm -hmm. them, abuse them, hit them and so on. So I think for me from that perspective, I mean obviously it speaks to a national issue and I think on the other side I found the NPA's decision also uh, in line with the sentiment in the country in mm -hmm. terms of, I mean she wasn't out there just to go and kill the person, she was there to protect the child and I think it's that motherly instinct kicking in. Mm -hmm. Professor? Well I think uh, the whole sense of justice as expressed by the people in this country uh, they actually are saying, put yourself in the same condi uh, uh, condition and situation, and what would you do? Yeah. And I think the verdict was very clear. Mm. I don't think the NPA had little choice on this, but mm. uh, we should also commend them for mm. understanding, because ultimately, 
justice is what uh, how people experience it mm. to say there are certain things that will not allow sometimes we tend to think that justice is uh, about talking about the uh, latin in court yeah. but it's also the fact that uh, it must be seen and must be felt and uh, the people of this country have actually expressed themselves and uh, fortunately the npa has uh, supported that sentiment. So nobody is seeing this as a, a, a taking justice into her own hands type of scenario, Melo? I think for me, it would be had there be some sort of premeditation on her part. Mm. So I think the thing that mitigates against that is the fact that it was almost instantaneous to yeah. that extent. Yeah. So we might not obviously want to, it might speak perhaps to the Oscar Pistorius thing where yeah. he goes and executes somebody in his bathroom yeah. because yeah. he believes that uh, he's rightfully... He's being attacked. Mm. Yes. Mm. But then I think in this case, there was actually visible and tangible evidence that the daughter was in danger and you could make a case for self-defense, which is a provision which uh, exists in our jurisprudence. Mm. All right. It's all right. Unfortunately, probably we're out of time. We're not going to look at Ahmed Timo, but we do know, of course, that uh, the, the, the judgment, of course, uh, uh, the, the inquiry found that Ahmed Timo was actually murdered. Yeah. How was the reaction on social media? Oh, the reaction was very interesting. Yeah. People obviously just saying, look, the South African justice system seems to be working yeah. after all so many years after the incident happened. Mm, let's and look at just one tweet yeah. there from Angel. What is she saying about it? She's saying, witnessed history today at the Timor Inquest, inquest yeah. 46 years later, it has been proved anti-apartheid activist Ahmed Timo was nice killed. killed. Wow, I mean, we've been waiting forever for the judgment. Where can people get this news and more? Bye -bye. So people can get these stories on www.sabc.co.za forward slash news. All right, walk with me, Babalo, as of course, after the break, we take a look at the number of primary school children that were allegedly abused in Soweto. And this continues to rise. We're coming back with that after the break. Show me a greater power on the whole continent of Africa. Show me a greater power anywhere. 6 of June 1918 was the establishment of our movement to maintain that we need to do something about the educational upliftment of the Afrikaner and we also need to do something about the economic uh, upliftment of the Afrikaner. And that was the two main goals at that stage in 1918. The Brotherhood never was a cultural organization. It was a state capturing organization. It is, in fact... I like that term. It, it, it has captured the financial systems. It has captured the, the parastatals. It has captured cultural organizations. For all your constitutional and legal matters, tune into Rights and Recourse on Sundays between 2 and 3 Central African time. You're watching Media Monitor. Welcome back. Gauteng Education MEC Banyaza Lesouf is currently meeting with parents at a primary school out at Orlando East in Soweto. The meeting follows allegations that a scholar patrol guard sexually assaulted close to 90 learners at the school. The school principal and the entire management team have since been suspended and the 57-year-old guard was reportedly arrested on Monday night and appeared in the Protea Magistrates Court on Wednesday on charges of sexually assaulting minors. Meanwhile, a 44-year-old Limpopo teacher who cannot be named as he is yet to plead appeared before the Tabamopo Magistrates Court in Leboa Como on Thursday. He was arrested on Wednesday after he allegedly sent pictures of his genitals to a 15-year-old female pupil and also asked her to send him nude pictures of herself. It's only now in September when the child raised another concern about Umkul that this grandparent started to add the dots. Mm. Uh, and I, I'm grateful to that parent, grandparent because if she didn't report that matter to us, uh, we would still be in the dark. So after reporting it, the school just did a, a dipstick analysis just to get uh, some confessions from our children. And when the numbers started to grow, they felt they need to report it to our officials and they needed professional services. It's only when professional services came uh, where people that are good in interviewing and getting the necessary consent from parents. Some of the children told them that uh, the school management advised them not to brief parents. Uh, <clears throat> it's an allegation that we are taking very serious. 
And that is why we've uh, immediately asked an independent firm uh, to come on board, uh, a legal firm, to investigate all these allegations. Who was supposed to report what? Did they do that? Uh, and how are we going to move forward in reviewing all our policies and also to deal with the, the, the support that we need? Because the most important thing is to immediately give support to those children. It's a serious matter. Actually, as a country, we should be shocked. It is a national disaster. Yeah. It is a dark clouds for all of us. For God's sake, these are children. Uh, so if you have children that are in grade R, that has to go through this pain. And uh, we have to protect them. We have to care them. We have failed them. <laughs> we have failed yeah. them. So that is why we have to do everything within our powers uh, to ensure that we give them the necessary support and care that they need. All right, we're very pleased to welcome for this discussion Mr. Steve Mabona, the Gauteng Education Department spokesperson, to give us more light about what's happening here. So a very good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Look, take us through, of course, the meeting that is currently uh, taking place. I know that you're saying that we hijacked you. You're actually going there shortly after this. What is going to be discussed? And is there going to be a way forward that is going to be deliberated upon? Yes, definitely. Remember, we have not met the parents uh, we've met with the stakeholders and we felt that we need to meet with parents. Hence, uh, we need to take them in confidence what transpired since this uh, matter started and uh, how we're going to be moving forward. And the uh, cooperation thereof, which we are actually pleased, most of them, they've been cooperating with our officials because remember, for us to do anything to engage with the learners, we need their, their consent mm -hmm. as parents. So we are actually indebted to them. They actually were cooperating very well with our officials mm. because we had um, stakeholders like your teddy bear clinic whom are very experienced when coming to child abuse uh, cases. Hence, when we called them on Tuesday, uh, they went on, the, on Tuesday the same day and they've been there you know, throughout the week. Hence, we have additional cases that are coming because uh, parents and uh, learners are comfortable to confide yeah. to the officials who are very experienced because they know how to ask uh, you know questions and um, we are actually indebted to them teddy bear because they've been working very mm. hard mm. you know mm. but then our officials uh, department of social development they are on board as well because we need capacity when coming to officials that are undertaking this process but we are for now we are uh, convinced that uh, probably will have uh, these cases uh, that are reported to the police you know finalized because we have an understanding that there's about 44 case dockets that have been opened mm -hmm. because initially we started with two moved to eight moved to 12 so we are now at 44 we're not sure whether that will increase but uh, we are working with the police very closely just to make sure that we monitor. Steve, let's talk about this. I mean, how did this happen? We hear that a learner had actually been assaulted and reported the incident to a teacher of which the teacher didn't pay attention. It was the grandmother who actually brought the matter up to the school. I mean, how does this go on unnoticed? Look, hence we have decided to launch the independent investigation yeah. as a department focusing on so many allegations that were coming from parents, that were coming from, you know, some community members to say the school was aware about this pattern. Probably they wanted to suppress. So hence we've decided to say let's remove the principal and the management, the management staff, from yeah. the school so that when we conduct that investigation, we would know that uh, whatever comes out there, uh, it will assist us on how to move forward in terms of action. Because remember, we cannot just suspend them or you know, expel them. We need to give them an opportunity. I mean, there's labor laws in the country, mm. which we need to adhere to. We need to give them an opportunity to respond to the allegations that are put on the, you know, on the table. So that process will go parallel. But we know that there's a police case that is continuing. Mm -hmm. We'll monitor that. Meanwhile, there's an investigative body that is investigating will be also monitoring that one all right now but does this signal steve the failure of systems at our schools look uh, mc has considered to that and uh, he has apologized and he said uh, we actually failed you know those learners all of us as the department 
as everyone in the schooling environment. You know, hence he said to the SGB, uh, they must then, you know, give us reasons why we must not dissolve them. Yeah. So the process has already commenced. We will be interacting with the SGB to say, give us reasons why we must not dissolve it. Because by law, we need to give them an opportunity to give us reasons. Because we will be uh, making an allegation. And then they need to respond to us to say, don't dissolve us, give us those reasons. But if the reasons um, that they give to us, we, we, we are not uh, satisfied, surely we'll then dissolve them. All right, gentlemen, let me find out from you. I mean, what should be the proper reaction from the department here? Yeah, I understand that there are uh, legal frameworks that they have to subject everyone involved through. But, I mean, what is the substantial reaction that, that, that should have happened here? Prof, let's start with you. Well, I think the sense of outrage uh, that uh, the MEC expressed uh, was also in keeping with what is not acceptable. But secondly, it was also proper for him to be seen not to only express outrage, but to take steps. Yeah. Because uh, ultimately, the most important thing is to protect the young children. And uh, so even if he erred, he may have erred on the side of caution, it's very important that at least the, the children are protected. So the suspension and also giving them an opportunity to explain themselves. But uh, what you are also asking is that how come a person could molest so many children and you have people who are unable to detect that, that the ultimate lead comes back to the, the Ukoko Ekaya, mm. who discovers that there's something amiss. So what it also means that they're really, as teachers, either the training of teachers uh, leaves much to be desired, mm. because some of these things they should be able to pick up. And uh, of course, uh, the principal, what is emerging is that at least there was an understanding that there was a protection. Yeah. And I think the MEC was actually correct to take those uh, preemptive steps but to also to say this is unacceptable, to send a message to all other pedophiles in the country. Mm. Melo, I mean, trauma like this is irreversible. These are such young kids. I mean, where to from here for these kids? And how should the media assist in making sure that none of this ever happens again? For me, I think I agree with you absolutely on the issue of trauma. But then another important thing is that we shouldn't condemn these kids now to their lives being over as, as if there's, uh, there's nothing more that they can be done to redeem them from the situation. Mm -hmm. It is a traumatic experience, but then we need to support them to rebuild their lives such that they can continue. Um, in terms of the media, for me, I think I'm very much encouraged by actually the media's coverage and bringing this thing up and highlighting it because were it not for the media, perhaps this issue would not be getting the attention that it's getting now. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, I think the media should be commended. It's something positive that they've done. I think in terms of steps, obviously, as they've, uh, the spokesperson has said, that they've engaged the Department of Social Services. I think they're from... Uh, in terms of a social work perspective, a lot of work needs to be done in sitting with those kids and providing them with counselling. And I think also within that entire schooling environment, whether it be the teachers and also the governing body, and also I think also issues of education in terms of around these issues, are, those are things that I think need to be taken care of and we need to be very much aware of that. But on the media side, I think I'm very happy to the extent to which the media has brought attention to this yeah. thing and it has conscientized society to these type of things. Professor, I'd like you to tell Mr. Steve Mabona, in light of uh, these uh, incidents, Incidents here. What can what measures can the department embark upon to make sure that the children are safe at school? Please tell him. No, I think uh, they are already doing a good job. First of all, you have to engage the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you must engage the people who are experts in the area. I mean, the social services mm -hmm. and the social uh, uh, development uh, uh, department, but also other stakeholders like they have in, uh, engaged who are experts on this. Because uh, as uh, my colleague says, what is also important is that uh, we must be careful about uh, our outrage, not ultimately marginalizing the kids. Because we might be so concerned about uh, the parents who had failed, and they, or our society who had failed the kids. But uh, we should also not fail them further. Hence, the notion of support services, psycho services that are being provided, mm -hmm. it becomes very important. But I do think that uh, the steps that have been taken themselves are very encouraging because mm -hmm. you didn't have a, an MEC who tried to explain it away because sometimes these things happen yeah. and you find the politicians who try to explain it away. Mm -hmm. Here, there was a, a leader who said, we are all 
at fault. We yeah. should uh, be able to be vigilant about it, some of these issues. Absolutely, and we absolutely commend the MEC for that. Mr. Mabone, we also have a story about that 44-year-old teacher who sent his private parts, a picture of his oh. private parts, to a pupil in school. I mean, how are these things just going by unnoticed? I mean, this is what I want to know. I hear the professor is scared to tell you exactly these are the measures that you need to undertake to ensure that the, the, the children are safe in school. Look, in our environment, we have what we call a um, school safety measure policy, which prioritizes our learners, educators, everyone who's in our schooling environment. That should be implemented by the schooling and, uh, you know, environment. There's a, what we call safety team, yeah. which is led by the principal of a school. You have RCL represented the educator, and an SGB. SGB so yes. the policy is there. We just need to implement. I mean, school safety is a priority, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. So that a teacher can send nude pictures to a learner. It's, a, it's in conduct. Even when you go to South African uh, Council of Educators, that is misconduct. That matter must be reported there. Uh, says must uh, do his work and uh, launch their own investigation. And that teacher must be taken out of the a teacher's role. Mm -hmm. So he will not be in a position to can teach anywhere in the country. Right. So a lot of work must happen and there's policy that is guiding us. We just need to implement. Mm -hmm. So in our environment when coming to safety we are vigilant hence the principal has a responsibility. If there's any sexual abuse protocol is there. You report to the police. You can't hide it. And yeah. if you didn't report surely then you should be charged. We should tell us why we must not be, you must not be charged. Mm. When looking at the weapons at school, drugs, uh, bullying as well, mm -hmm. it's there in the policy. You just need to implement and make sure that you take necessary action when this are reported to you. Mr. Mabon, I'll definitely uh, make a call to you after your meeting with the MEC and the parents. That should be around 11 o'clock before 12 o'clock. Can you promise me an update on that? Definitely, we will. That. That's why we've invited the media. We work very well with the media. We don't hide anything. All right. And uh, it's important for us to come. I mean, even the numbers of learners uh, that are in increment, we break ourselves those yeah. numbers and we'll continue to do that. All right, Steve, thank you so much. That is Mr. Steve Mabona of the Gauteng Education Department talking to us about some of the developments in our schools this past week. After the break, what steps will the NPA take now as the Supreme Court of Appeal has rejected President Jacob Zuma's spy tapes appeal? Find out after this break. Countries in the East African region have started experimenting with wines. Located in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo in South Kivu province, this park is the only place in the world to find the Eastern Lowland Gorillas. But the most famous monument in Casablanca is of course the Mosque Hassan II. The mosque is the third largest in the Muslim world. The city of Tel Aviv and Israel's tourism ministry have teamed up with the local hotel chain to temporarily transform the tower into a two-story suite with hot tub, room service and very unobstructed ocean views. Catch trains travel every Sunday from 12 to 1 for all the global travel and leisure trains. Welcome back. The Supreme Court of Appeal, ACA in Bloemfontein, has dismissed with costs the appeal by President Jacob Zuma and the National Prosecuting Authority in the spy tape saga. Now, this means it's now up to the NPA to decide whether or not to reinstate the 783 fraud and corruption charges against the president. Justice Eric Leach delivered the much-anticipated ruling dismissing the NPA and Zuma's appeal against a 2016 decision by the North Gauteng High Court in Pretoria that found that the NPA's decision to drop the charges against Zuma in 2009 that related to fraud, racketeering, as well as money laundering were indeed irrational. The NC says they will have a way forward only after the NPA has taken a decision 
while the NPA says they won't comment now as they are still considering the matter. Here's more on this clip. Is nothing. After the concessions, the outcome was almost a foregone conclusion. The decision to drop the charges was irrational, which means the 2007 decision to prosecute stands. But the court went a step further, raising concern around law enforcers spying on each other, and added that the legality of President Zuma's legal team's possession of the tapes is doubtful. Points out that contravening the Interception Act carries a hefty penalty. It remains unclear whether law enforcement agencies will pursue this particular aspect. This while the NPA still weighs up its options. It means that it's back to the NPA as to what will happen. Uh, the leadership team, after it has considered the judgment, will take the South African public into their confidence in terms of the way forward. The judgment reveals in the 2009 representation, Zuma, who was then just ANC president, argued there are legal implications in prosecuting a sitting president and there's a risk of economic and social instability. Now Zuma insists he must be afforded an opportunity to make fresh representations. Aldrin Simpier, SABC News, Johannesburg. Let's speculate, gentlemen. Do you see the NPA reinstating those charges? Huff? Yeah, well, actually, we must actually deal with the case uh, as it was. It took the judge less than 10 minutes to deliver because there was nothing complex about the case. It was a question of uh, when the DA went over to challenge the decision by Mshe, it was uh, to argue that uh, the decision was irrational. And therefore, given that there was a case against the government, it needs to be reinstated. And the High Court supported the DA. So the, when these guys went to the Supreme Court of Appeal, first uh, we must remember that the NPA did not go to the Supreme Court of Appeal. It went straight first to the to the constitutional court to say we have a court that tell, that uh, seems to ov be overreaching. The notion of reinstatement of the case is our responsibility. Yeah. Is not the responsibility of the court. So they they went there with one thing in mind to t say the court must pronounce on whether a, a, a court can instruct uh, another branch of government to do certain things. Mm. But they both of them, both Jacob Zuma, the president's uh, lawyers, as well as NPA agreed upon questioning that uh, it may be that the, the argument presented by, by Mshe was not sustainable mm -hmm. because the court also wanted to point out that even the case law that he, he relied on was not the right one. Yeah. So the issue of irrationality was already dealt with. So the, the court agreed with the NPA, agreed with the president, and agreed with the DA that the decision was irrational. That, that, that's why. But what most people were hoping is the court to pronounce on whether uh, the other court is correct to reinstate. Mm. So that was left. But they, uh, remember that the argument that was also presented by the NPA and the president was to say, we would like this matter because we made the representation and Mpshe only responded to one part of the representation, not the entirety of the representation. So their appeal to the court was to allow us to go back to the NPA so that uh, we hear about the broader representation that we made beyond the spy tapes. So that's what people need to, need to understand. So that's why every newspaper now is correct to say it's back to the NPA to make that decision. Mm. So you're asking us whether we should speculate. I, I think... <laughs> Finally, Professor. <laughs> no, no. They, 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 for me, the, the case, I was actually, yesterday I was reading Nicholson's judgment. And uh, he was also saying after the, afterwards, that after the spy tapes, the spy tapes actually proved the point that he was making. He says, as a judge, now looking back, I can say my decision on throwing the case out is actually correct. So you have a judge who's willing, but remember when he made that decision, it was before the spy tapes. And what he was arguing was a notion of conspiracy and abuse of power. So the question is whether the NPA or the president's uh, lawyers will try to pick up all the pieces that were raised by other judges. Remember, this case was thrown out three times. It was not only once. Yeah. And each judge had a concern that they were raising. Mm -hmm. And uh, so cumulatively, the NPA must look at all of this before it rushes to court. Because what they did with Vukam uh, Shabalala is that when they went there, they were unprepared and said, no, look, until you guys have done your work. So here you have a case that has had a number of 
as the uh, Shabalala put it, limping from one crisis to another. Mm -hmm. And also, if you take the time it has taken, and remember some people were saying we were driven by making sure that he does not become the president. Now yeah. that he is a president and his term is coming to an end, the energy that some people may have had, and also the fact that some uh, witnesses may have died and some of them may not be unwilling. <laughs> so yeah. the, the, the dynamic is very different. So they need to go back to all each and every witness to say, are you prepared now to come for the, Because when he was charged, he was not a president. Yo, mm -hmm. Melo, I mean, are we ever going to see this case in court while well, all these charges? Is it ever going to go to court? Is Jake, President Jacob Zuma ever going to have his day in court, according to you? If the professor is saying the, the NPA still needs to look at the previous rulings to take into consideration before they make a, an announcement on whether or not they'll reinstate the charges. I think obviously that's a difficult question to answer whether eventually he might go to court or not. I mean, a lot of things could happen. But one thing that one can say definitely is that given that the NPA has discretion to make a decision to charge him or not, I mean, that decision in itself, once it's made, it's subject to a rationality test to some extent, right? What should so, the NPA do? So if that decision is subject to a rationality test, then that means that then the DA and so on, if he decides to exonerate Zuma and says that no, Zuma doesn't have to be charged, then we'll see another round of court battles which may go on for about three, four years before we actually get to a final point where there's Zuma faces charges. I think for me, a very interesting issue around the spy tapes, right, relates to whether or not those spy tapes are admissible. And the one thing that they said in that judgment is that what happened is that the spy tapes were gotten in the process of tapping Leonard McCarthy's phone for the browse mode investigation. Yeah. So there is a judge uh, signed order that said that the, those, uh, those things could have gotten been, uh, obtained. So that, to that extent, I think it sort of like squashes the issue of whether those spy tapes are legal or not. But then as to whether or not the spy tapes have any bearing on cancelling the uh, the charges which Zuma must face, I think that's the thing that's different. For me, like picking up on what uh, Kemp J. Kemp said at the SCA oral argument, he's saying that they're not disputing that the spy tapes by themselves do not constitute mm. grounds to withdraw the charges. They're saying that the spy tapes in addition to yes. other things. Yeah. So it's all these other factors. So if mm. maybe, for example, you have five factors, and if you just look at one factor by itself, maybe it does not constitute withdrawing the charges. That's what the, the council said in yes. court. Yeah. But then if you have like five other things, then it constitutes grounds. So this is the decision that Sean Abrahams now must go back and actually go and see and decide whether or not he's going to withdraw. So obviously from a political perspective also, it brings about the issue that Sean Abrahams was appointed by Zuma. You do not know what agreements may have been made uh, in um, preceding that appointment. So, I mean, obviously, it would, uh, I suppose, I mean, be incumbent. That's what everybody is talking about now, that yes. he's not likely to reinstate the charges against him. Yes, yeah. but then, so maybe if I can just finish. So, yes. the difficulty there is that much as you may make agreements with somebody on the side about what you will do, once you get into office, you are hold sure. to certain ob mm. uh, obligations, mm. constitutional standards which you have to meet out. So, in that sense, his bit constraint is in the bit of a corner there. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how he wiggles himself out of that corner. No, Melo, people must be vetted properly and put in. in Positions because they deserve them not to make prior arrangements to be put in a position. Exactly. I prof. mean, you see, the, the, the reason why I'm uncomfortable with this mm. argument of the president appointing some people that mm. people who have been appointed by the president, yes, the proper top was appointed by the president, yes. You, you take when you get into office, you take an oath, mm. and the uh, was appointed by the president, yes. And everybody said he was a lake. Actually, you should see the attacks on Mohoe mm. Mohoe. They did not even wait for him mm. to say anything just because uh, the president did not choose their preferred candidate. So I think we must also be very careful about how, because as long as in acting out and executing his constitutional responsibility, he appoints people because it's allowed. Yeah. We should allow that to happen. But we should not start questioning people beforehand until they prove and they disprove ourselves, uh, us in terms of even confidence. But I do think that... Uh, Sean has a difficulty here mm. because this is a very long case. I can tell you that the people's memory uh, lapses even within a year. But when you have a case that has been going on for almost 10 years, yeah, then geez. you have it. And remember also, you also have judges who had also add on the case. If you remember the Supreme Court of Appeal, yeah. where it was claiming that uh, this is what Squire said, mm. another judge. And the judge woke up uh, a year later and said, but I never said so. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you, you, they never even bothered to read yeah. their judgment by squares. Mm -hmm. So this is so tainted that uh, ultimately, I think uh, if one were to give advice to, to, to uh, Sean, is to get the team to look at it again. Mm -hmm. 
and make sure that they look at every inch so that when he goes there, he does not embarrass himself. I mean, his credibility but, is quite at stake here, Melo. But I think for me, another thing, uh, I think I agree fully with the prof that we shouldn't... Uh, uh, disparage or cast aspersions on people based on who they were appointed, who they were by. appointed but by. But then the problem with Sean Abraham is if you follow that uh, Pravin Gordon charging saga, he's already cast aspersions on himself. I mean, he's already admitted that there's some things that he does without actually thinking properly about them. So then in that sense, I think using yeah. that as a basis, then you can say that actually, no, we're not coming from a very good uh, standing. We should actually be very much uh, cautious and leery of what decision is going to come out of that process. Mm, all right. But who gets the credit? Is it the DA or the media for, you know, for their relentless fight throughout all these years to get this ruling? I think the DA, we can give it to them. <laughs> Prof, one no, no, I think you, you should give it to, to the DA. Yeah. Uh, the only question that uh, some of former members of the EDA are saying is that uh, the DA must not become too obsessed with Jacob yeah. Zuma yeah. because his term is coming to an end. And uh, effectively, you can't always uh, try to find an enemy. We have bigger challenges in this country that they must also address. Professor Simposiep, <laughs> Mr. Melo Maholejo, bringing a sound analysis of some of the biggest stories of this week. Let's say goodbye to them. And of course, after the break, we look at the African developments. Stay tuned for that. Africa is constantly getting new technologies and with that comes new terms. Massive open online universities and primarily what they are doing is they're established in the community so they're well established within the Soweto community. Internet of Things also covers small sensors so you can do like home security, motion detectors, uh, IP cameras. Our network which simplifies its terms for you. We also have new gadgets and social media. When it falls on the grounds and then the battery, everything falls off, people just put it all together and then your, your phone is, is back in shape. The Vilega app, we initially started off by doing this uh, manually. The internet is actually my favorite fashion invention of all time. That's Network with Ms. Pomele Lezondi every Sunday at 9 p.m. on SABC News. Welcome back in our Africa News Update this week. We are very pleased to welcome the People's Analyst, Untate Izakom, our very own SABC Channel Africa journalist and analyst who's an expert on African affairs. And he is here to tell us about the outcome of the elections in Liberia and, of course, the political crisis in Kenya. Mr. Komo, very good morning to you, sir. What a pleasure. Good morning. Thank you for having me, ma'am. All right. Let's start with Kenya with that announcement by Raila Odinga and now the protests, that the black protests that have seen two people being shot let's talk about that where can we expect what can we expect with the coming elections do you think they're still going to take place well I suppose the elections are going to take place I mean so they've been ordered by the court aren't they yeah so they would do going to take place without the main opposition without the main opposition he has pulled out but then the electoral and border condition uh, commission say that his name will still be on the roll because he's not officially pushed uh, his um, sort of I um, mean, requested his uh, withdrawal. Mm -hmm. But I mean to say that uh, with his withdrawal, he's got another statement saying that he's ready for talks. Yeah. You see, now that actually sort of uh, exposes him, really. Yeah, he, basically, you've got to understand Kenyan, uh, uh, politi the political situation. Uh, Kenyan political parties, basically, they're not political parties as such, but they're parties which have been run by elites. Mm -hmm. And these are reg uh, uh, regional and... Uh, uh, ethnic elites, or we can say tribal elites. And then the following that they've got is basically following of their uh, clansmen or their tribesmen or the people who come from the same region. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So basically there's not much of uh, political issues. I mean, political issues are not really deeply involved. But now what we're trying to see about him saying that now he's open for for debates now. For, 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 How for can discussion. you pull out and then you say no, you're ready for happens, discussions? That's what happens. I mean, you've created a situation where there is strife and, and insecurity. And to go forward, you want to be co-opted mm. into the coming uh, government, you know. So that's what happens. But that's how African politics actually sort of does exist. If you look at African countries in the era of democracy, you find countries 
with a population of about uh, two, three million, places like Gabon, yeah. Cameroon. But they've got something like about 34 to 35 political parties. Yeah. So, I mean, so you cannot explain that there are 35 uh, political um, attitudes. Yeah. Yeah. But what's happened is that every man comes there with his uh, tribesmen or his people, he's an elite. And then he, he actually comes as a politician hoping that uh, the big man is going to co-opt him. Yeah. Into the coming power structure. Yeah. Yeah. So that is what, how the elite operates. Again, with the many political parties, some of them are formed by the by the incumbent yeah, to divide the opposition. You know, it's like so when that's you. That's how the uh, African politics uh, should sort of operate. Very interesting that you mentioned mm -hmm. that. I was actually reading this morning about how the the Liberian election system actually works uh, mm -hmm. in, in 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 the fact that it actually looks pretty much like the U.S. political system. Talk mm -hmm. to us about that and the fact that we know that uh, Weya is currently leading at this stage, but of course we can only await the final results uh, later on this month. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, uh, the way the Liberian political situation acts, I mean, to say that um, there's real politics there yeah. and there's real anger and bitterness. But the beautiful thing is this, that uh, that anger and bitterness has not been taken to the bush. Yeah. A um, uh, very interesting thing is this, that if you see where they say he's leading, football star. Yeah. And there even some news saying that in the last elections, he, was really, he really won the elections. He's <laughs> highly popular. Yeah, but his running mate is Charles Taylor's wife. Oh, yes. Yeah. And they're leading now by 39.9%, uh, almost 40%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the former vice president, Wokai, he's actually second at, uh, they say, about 30%. Are we certain to see a runoff? No, no. They say, off? Yeah, the, the runoff is, it will definitely come. I mm. think right now they say about 75% of the results have come. There's no way that you can get a clear cut. I mean, a person can get 50%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But now the mere fact that she is where a very uh, populist um, candidate and then Charles Taylor's wife. It shows that uh, the Charles Taylor camp uh, is actually strong. In fact, they're very bitter. Because after Charles Taylor was actually uh, taken to the Sierra Leone uh, tribunal, they were banned from actually forming yeah. a party. And anybody who actually was in Charles Taylor's party was totally banned. Yet you find at the same time people warlords. Like Sally herself, she was a warlord. Mm. Yeah. yeah. In fact, she was the first one who started fighting against Samuel Doe when she got um, Colonel Thomas yeah, to, uh, to actually try to, try to push against um, Samuel Doe, which failed. Yeah. And again, they were actually assisted by Sierra, by Sierra Leone, yeah, which actually says that Sierra Leone had actually poking itself in Liberian political affairs. That's the thing that people do not see. Charles what, what Taylor never the exported re the, re the rebellion to, 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 to Sierra get Leone. To the state. Yeah. Yeah? Sierra Leone actually formed Ulimo yeah? mm. of uh, Al Haji Koroma and uh, Roosevelt Johnson. People forget that. But, but then put that aside. Isaac, yeah? let's talk about that. I mean, we know that it's going to be uh, 70, is it 75 years mm. of, uh, that we're going to see democratic, uh, the democratic transfer of power. Mm. The opposition has already said that they're going to contest the outcome of the elections. Where does this situation leave Liberia? I mean, we know that no, Ellen Sirleaf took over that. a damaged country. No, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, to say that so long as they go to the proper channels. In fact, the thing has been catered for, yeah? There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, to say to, pro, to contest, I mean, the DA contested rulings, you know, yeah. you go to court. But and how can so you preempt, Isaac, mm. and say, well, we're going to uh, contest the outcome of this, re yeah, uh, this because, result? Um, from because what is happening now, I think they must have seen that there have they've been some... Yeah, there have been you know, polling stations, yeah, yeah. apparently, that it were closing late Not and some that, corruption was a, taking place there's there. There's there. Even an operator of a polling station was caught stuffing papers mm. and he's in custody. Mm. Yeah, so the, you've got to give it time. You know, if they're going to protest, let them protest. All right. Yeah. All so right. that's it, yeah. Babukom, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so, so much. I was just going to pick your brain about what you think about the new, uh, of course, the, pos the opposition in Lesotho calling for a motion of no confidence in uh, the, the Tom Tabane government. Let's leave it there for <laughs> now, though. That is Obabu Izakoba, an African affairs specialist, talking to us about some of the stuff uh, that has been happening in and around our continent. Uh, next week, of course, is, uh, of course, uh, Media Monitor, same time and place on Sunday. Do remember to tune in. And of course, up next is your AM News. I'm with Marumo Gekana. Stay tuned for that.